<laughs> so I guess this is going to be a lecture on high temperature superconductivity. Uh, welcome uh, uh, everybody to the 1990 edition of the uh, Mac Lecture, the Julian Mac Lecture. Uh, this lecture is given every year to honor the memory of Professor Mac, and it is an honor indeed to introduce the speaker for uh, this year's lecture, Professor John Bardeen. Without much eloquence, I'll just mention that he's the only person that ever received two Nobel Prizes in physics, as a matter of fact, two Nobel Prizes in the same discipline. And uh, the uh, reasons for uh, receiving these uh, prizes uh, are evident in everyday life, transistors and superconductivity. So I think that uh, as a solid state physicist, I must consider him one of the founders of my field. And in general, uh, I think he has uh, given a message to uh, physicists of all kinds that uh, in many cases uh, you find very fundamental and very important physics in problems that have applications as well. Professor Bardeen has uh, strong ties with Wisconsin. His father was the dean of the medical school, and if you go around, you'll see a building with the name Bardeen, uh, which is named after him. He was a, a student here, and is, of course, the, by far the most distinguished of our, of our alumni. So uh, I'd like to stop here and uh, say that uh, uh, this is uh, not only a, a welcome back to uh, Madison as his former school, but indeed is a welcome back home. It is an honor to host you here. Is the microphone on? Can everyone hear me? Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and an honor to give the Julian Mack Lecture. He was a very good friend of mine for many years. Uh, the, uh, as uh, was mentioned, uh, I'm a native of Madison and got my education here. I took electrical engineering at the university, but was much interested in mathematics and physics, so I took lots of extra courses in math and physics and uh, knew uh, many of the graduate students in physics at that time. Uh, a couple of them uh, uh, still survive. <laughs> uh, Raleigh Rolison and Ray Herb. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see them again after all these years. Uh, I had met many fine teachers, but I think the one I owe the greatest debt to is uh, uh, J.H. Van Vleck, known as Van, to his many friends and students. Uh, he was a son of a distinguished uh, mathematics professor here at the University of Wisconsin um, and uh, went to Harvard for his graduate work. Uh, he was an assistant professor at Minnesota for a short time until he was uh, offered a full professorship here at the university and came here in 1928. Uh, this is just about the time the revolution in quantum theory was coming about, uh, mostly uh, in Germany and some in England. He's one of the few who didn't go to Germany to get his training. He got his training at Harvard. And there's one of the pioneers in applying quantum theory to the properties of solids. His book on electric and magnetic susceptibilities published in 1932 is still a classic in the field. And he made uh, many other distinguished contributions uh, later himself and had uh, many students who went on uh, uh, I was fortunate to be able to 
sit in. I, I actually took the course for credit. I didn't just sit in. The <laughs> uh, 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 course he gave in quantum mechanics in 1928, which must have been one of the first uh, courses in quantum theory given in this country. Uh, the following summer, 1929, Paul Dirac gave a series of lectures based on his book. Uh, looking at the lecture notes, you can read almost word for word what uh, appeared later in his book. Uh, so that I got an early start in quantum theory, but my interests at that time were in electrical engineering and geophysics. It was only a few years later that I, I got the bug to go back to graduate school when I heard that Einstein was coming to the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. So I decided to quit my job in 1933 in the middle of the Depression and go back to graduate school. I thought my mathematics was stronger than physics, so I enrolled in the mathematics department and I got my PhD there a couple of years later. Uh, but it was through the influence of Van Vleck, who subsequently moved to Harvard, that I got a three-year postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard, uh, and uh, that was the first time I was really in the physics department. And so I owe Van a great debt for uh, getting me started in my career and for uh, many pleasant associations uh, since that time. I originally planned to call uh, this talk uh, Macroscopic Quantum Phenomena, but I was afraid that might scare too many people away, <laughs> so I called it Superconductivity and, and Macroscopic uh, Quantum Phenomena, <laughs> since... Uh, <laughs> since superconductivity is such a hot subject these days. <laughs> I understand there are over 9,000 papers published in the last three years on superconductivity, so uh, that's uh, been very active. But actually, only a small part of this lecture will be on, on uh, superconductivity. Uh, what I hope to do is uh, show you that these really are quantum phenomena and can be only understood through quantum mechanics. But all you really need is the bare essentials of quantum mechanics to understand the superfluidity and helium and the other macroscopic quantum phenomena. And what I hope to do is to try to give you uh, some idea of how quantum theory enters the macroscopic world, the world of, uh, of man-sized objects, uh, in just the way it does in, for electrons uh, moving around uh, the nucleus of an atom. But most of my talk will be on uh, slides. I do have a short uh, uh, vi videotape I'll show later on in the lecture, but the first, uh, uh, I have some transparencies I'd like to show first. And the first one is just to show what some of the macroscopic uh, Can you read that? Uh, what some of the macroscopic qu quantum phenomena are. The one I'll actually talk about most is superfluidity in helium. At very low temperatures, uh, uh, at, uh, helium boils at atmospheric uh, pressure, about four degrees. If you cool it down to about 2.2 degrees, Goes under, undergoes a phase transition into a superfluid state where it flows like a perfect fluid with uh, zero viscosity 
uh, and uh, it's a, a potential flow, no, vo uh, no vorticity. Uh, others are nuclear matter, probably one of the largest uh, superconducting objects in the world are neutron stars, uh, which are objects uh, as about as massive as the sun, but with a diameter only 10 or 20 kilometers, and essentially made up of nuclear matter and uh, they're superfluid or superconducting, if you like, uh, and there's very strong evidence that that's the case. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard about superconductivity uh, in which uh, uh, electrons flow in a metal with uh, no resistance. Uh, until recently, uh, the only superconductors, uh, only place you found superconductivity is in various metals and alloys uh, with the highest uh, transition temperature, about 23 Kelvin, 23 degrees above the absolute zero. Uh, in the last three years, as probably most of you know, there's been explosion with, uh, uh, with uh, ceramic oxides, metallic ceramic oxides, uh, which are superconducting. I think the highest is around 125 Kelvin. So the transition temperature has gone up about a factor of five in three years. Uh, and this uh, goes out accounts for the 9,000 uh, odd papers. Uh, <clears throat> I won't talk about the uh, quantum Hall effect, the or charged density waves. The only other one I will talk about is the uh, semiconductor laser, uh, which you may not think of as uh, having uh, quantum aspects, but they exhibit uh, uh, the quantum aspects of uh, discrete states and macroscopic occupation of discrete states in uh, the simplest form because everything else is uh, classical. And that's the first one I'll discuss and then talk about liquid helium and then toward the end, uh, superconductivity. I won't try to explain why the superconducting oxides have such high transition temperatures. So the theme of this talk so can you read that? The theme of this talk is uh, as I uh, uh, mentioned uh, macroscopic occupation of discrete states that even uh, large objects, uh, the states are discrete, although energy states are discrete, although very closely spaced in energy. Uh, and uh, it's possible to have a macroscopic occupation of uh, these states, and uh, that's what gives rise to these uh, remarkable properties. And so as a result of having discrete states and the possibility of macroscopic occupation, by that I mean uh, a large fraction of the time being in just one of these quantum states, even though they're very closely spaced, a fraction of fair, reasonable fraction of the time they're in, uh, in just one of the many possible states. <clears throat> 